Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming Prince Shah Landin to the channel. Some of you may know him as the Mighty Hebrew, but for today I'm going to be calling him Prince Shah Landin. So Prince Shah Landin, please can you tell us who is Prince Shah Landin? Hallelujah, hallelujah. First and foremost, I give praise and honor to Yahweh, the supreme intellect and intelligent one of our forefathers. Abraham, be skaki, I call those striving for righteous sake all over the planet Earth. I say unto the family, Shalom Aleichem. It's definitely an honor and privilege to be on Esoteric Thoughts. I, you know, um, I heard much about Esoteric Thoughts. And um, again, it's an honor to give a brief synopsis about my background. Um, Starting in 1999, I enrolled, by the way, of Nasi Yashu Ben Yahuda, the School of the Prophets Institute at the Mona Israel, Northeastern Africa. I studied as an understudy of him for six years and my master's in African Middle Eastern Studies, along with my degree that I got in 2014 in Hebrew Divine Fundamentalism under Nasi Ram Ben Yahuda, one of the Nasikim or the princes over in Demona, Israel, Northeastern Africa. Um, for five and a half years, I was a contributing columnist for the Jerusalem Chronicle newspaper by the way of editor-in-chief Adon or Zakwe Adon, um, Yehoshaphat in Israel. I wrote for them for five years. I wrote for, you know, um, a few magazines or newspapers, the African World View, little cuts here and there for the um, Philadelphia Tribune. Um, oh man, I've done a lot. I don't even know where to like start and end. Um, I wrote a book called True History of Diaspora and Our Freedom. I'm working on a new book now called 311 Trillion 40 Billion BCE to Now. Um, I just came up with an album in November called Mind Mental Is Never Destroyed. That's out all over the world, Apple, um, Amazon, you name it, YouTube music is everywhere. And my newest album um, should be out in the next few days called Journey to the Dark Side of the Moon. But the um, pre-orders of the album has already been shipped. Everybody that pre-ordered already got the album. Oh man, and the list goes on. I'm the founder of Hebrew Israelite Sovereign Nationalism, uh, Esoteric School of Thought known as Hebrew Cosmogenesis, Hebrew Anthropogenesis, the Mighty Hebrew University, which is the first online official accredited university, esoteric theology university. Um, one certificate adds up to three credits, college credits. So you can take these college credits to go to any college basically in the United States and them credits are recognized. Um, they might be university, you can go to tmhu.org um, where brothers and sisters can enroll when they enroll. You know, then they can go inside the university where they get the syllabus, the marginals, et cetera. Just like any online university, for instance, Southern New Hampshire University. You know, if you don't want it online, it's the same exact way, the same hookup. On and on, the mighty bridge, right? Sovereign nationalistic repatriation movement. I repatriated back to Africa, 2021. I'm here, I'm a resident in Tanzania, East Africa. Um, I've traveled different parts of Africa, the West Coast of Africa, along with the East Coast of Africa, such as um, I've been to Kenya, um, to uh, Malawi, um, Uganda, Tanzania, Zanzibar, Israel, I mean, different places, uh, Ghana, Nigeria. So, you know, um, it's definitely a blessing to be here. The list can go on and on, but whenever you're ready to start, I'm here, hallelujah. Sure. So you have the title of Prince. How did you get that title? Oh uh, yeah, oh uh, man. I was uh, appointed a Prince in 2016 by the way of Nasik or Prince Asiel Ben Israel. the International Ambassador and Prime Minister of the original Hebrew Israelite Sovereign Nationalistic Movement. He was one of the three founders of the Kingdom of Yaw, the station in Demona, Israel, 
northeastern Africa. You had the late Adonai Rabbeinu Ben Yisrael HaMashiach. Y'all affectionately know him as Ben Ami. Then you had the late Prince Dr. Shaliyah Ben Yahuda. He is the original founder and dean of the School of the Prophets Institute in Gamona, Israel, northeastern Africa. Then you had the Redeeming Angel, our international ambassador, Prince Asiel Ben Yisrael. His job was to connect with different African heads of state all over Africa and connect them with the Israelite experience in the Southern Negev and Demona, Israel, Northeastern Africa. So a lot of like the celebrities like Whitney Houston, Bobby Brown, the Neville Brothers, uh, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, oh uh, man, Barry White, the list goes on and on, that visit the Kafar in Demona, Israel, Northeastern Africa. Uh, we see that experience by the way of the shot where Prince Asiel Ben Israel. So getting stuck into my question, we're going to start with some very basic, something that may seem as very basic, but I know your answers are going to be far from basic. So my question to you is, first question is, who do you believe God is? That's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, when we talk about God, okay, there's already a preconceived notion from the individual that's imposing the question. Now, this is an attack on your question, but there is a preconceived idea. That's, that, that, that has to be understood. Whether if you're coming from an Islamic standpoint, uh, a Gnostic standpoint, a Christian standpoint, a Jewish, Hindu, whatever the case may be, there's already a preconceived notion. So God, first of all, goes back to our Aramaic Hebrew word, God, which is the God of fortune, so to say. And it crossed over into Old High German, when you get good and things like that, to the English. But the etymology isn't important. What's important is the psychology behind the person that's conveying the word. God is a social construct that has been developed based on circumstances, environmental conditions, behavioral patterns, you know, social behavior, adaptation. So, when you look at the United States, most people that speak, speak of God is from a Christian standpoint, even if they're not openly Christian, but because of the social environment, it plays a role on the psyche. Now, do I believe in God? No. Yahweh, Yahweh, it's, an actual, it's actually an eternal idea conceptualized by thought. Meaning when you say Yahqua, it means I will forever become what I will to become. So that which is or which was, is and will forever be. The closest that we can tap into this understanding would be universal mathematics with consciousness pushing it out or emanating. When you look at everything in existence, everything is vibrationally moving by the way of mathematics. And this right here is what's universal or even multiversal when it comes to understanding the all in all. The all in all is everything. And even everything that isn't even conceptualized as being a part of everything. Picture water waves. If you're at an ocean site and you see the ocean, and when you look at the ocean, the ocean is in its calmness, it's still. So all you see it's this ocean, but there's a strong wind that comes 
it hits the surface of the ocean and it starts to create waves. Now, to one who doesn't have the vantage point of understanding the many and the one, they will look at the ocean waves as individualistic entities. But in fact, all our water was the ocean waves. Water was what we see in the surface. All was just water. Another example, um, you can go get the book by Rab Yemeyahu, known as Open Secrets. And the Rab that was teaching Yemeyahu, one of his pupils, said, Walk, a picture yourself walking down the street, and it's a rainy day, and you see children at play at least five, and they're in a the puddle of mud, just one puddle of mud. But each child individually makes a character out of the mud figures that they make out of this one puddle of mud. A father, a mother, a sister, a brother, an aunt. Out of these five children at play, there are individual characters that have their own separate idea. But to the initiated adapt, or the reality standpoint, mud was their source, mud was their substance. In essence, all the figures were just mud. That's the same with us in the emanated one. All is just yakwa, but we're vibrating on different frequencies. So in that retrospect, we defer um, individualistically, but for the all the manifest all possibilities, there has to be an individual to have a collective or a collective to have an individual. There has to be a subjective. There has to be an objective. There has to be duality. So Yahwa is expressed only by the way of duality known as Elohim, but it's bigger than that. So to say all that, to give these examples is there's no separation from Yahwa in the emanation of Yahwa. It's this expression of that which is or which wills to exist. So you don't see God as outside of yourself? No. Okay. No. What you see in the scripture is for the lack of word, I use the word em emanation, but for the viewing audience, it is a growth and evolution of a nation that started and with people defined as a paganistic world, meaning human sacrifice or sacrifice in general was the social norm universally amongst the nations of the earth. Whether they were sacrificing animals, humans, whatever the case may be, these things were going on. The Hebrews came out of that. Now, one might say, well, why are you saying this, Prince Shalandin, the mighty Hebrew? When you see Abraham, because the reason why I'm saying this, because you were in the argument, what kind of God would have you put a child on the altar to sacrifice, not understanding the psychology and growth of a people coming from a, out of an already existing world of sacrifice. Now, when one reads that, that scripture, is that the picture? When Abraham put his son up on the altar as a token of sacrifice by the way of his imuna, his faith. And when you see this, and he, you know, light the fire, he does all that. One thing that people never realize is when Abraham was supposedly commanded to do this, and then after he was commanded to put him on the altar, you don't you notice something was never done. The communication of this higher self didn't instruct to proceed on the sacrifice. They just it just Originally, the thought from Abraham is telling 
himself to put his child upon the altar and then from there wait for the instruction to do the next move. But the problem is there was never no response and then the next chapter comes in. Now, one may not have noticed that, but to a master, they understood clear that that signified the end of a conscious thought of thinking one way with that sacrificial mind state to elevate now to another state of consciousness where that thought or that psychological behavior wouldn't be necessary. That's what they felt they missed. It was a, a metaphor, true, it happened, but the principle has to be abstracted. The abstraction was, we are now heading to another state of consciousness and that thought within that epoch of time or dispensation is gnawing and void. That's why if you look at the nations of the earth, human sacrifice was common. Animal sacrifice was common. Sacrifice in general was common. But originally, that was within the downfall during the Patalia or the Atlantean root epic. We started to add these things to the universal laws. Remember, the word Torah don't mean law. It means instruction. It would be the instruction to guide us back to the universal law. This is what many Hebrews don't understand. They look at the Torah as the universal law. No, the Torah is a constitutional frame of instructions to help us lead us back to the universal laws of your Yisrael. That's two different things. Speaking of the Hebrew Israelites, something that I struggle with in many of my dialogues with Hebrew Israelites and Christians in particular is that of literalism, taking the Bible in a very literal way. How do you see the literalism or the non-literalism in the Bible? That's a good, that's a, that's a good question. That's a good question. When you go, let's use Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, you know, and then six days, everything was created. And then the seventh day, there was rest. One of the problems that many people that take the, I'm gonna say portions of the Bible literal, because one has to understand what's literal and what's non-literal. You see what I'm saying? And the only way, to get an understanding of that, there has to be adapted masters around you. Any type of Eastern school of thought, Matt, if you're talking about Kemet, if you're talking about um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Brahmanism, Confucianism, Taoism, Zen, whatever the case may be, Eastern school of thought always had within their structure uh, that body of initiatives that were able to take their school of thought to a higher plane. Like for instance, in Islam, the strenuous uh, methods that they speak about are your Sunni and your Shiite, but the mystical side is Sufism. I'm, 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 I'm using that as an example to show that there has always been uh, that body that understood the higher dimensions of that thought. Before we had Nabaim or Nabim, we had seers. Anybody that understand the scripture there see that there were verses outlined in Joshua that we went from the seer epic to the Nabaim, meaning that there were those that were able to travel, so to say, with they thought. But getting to the Genesis, we've been told that the earth has been created in six days and boom, God rested. And created this one man named Adam, this one woman named Eve, and then you got the talking serpent, and, and just and Adam ate an apple, and did the fall, blaming on the woman, et cetera, et cetera. We heard that right of it, but that is not what the better sheet code or the Genesis is saying in its original Hebrew thought. It's not saying that. One of the problems is, is 
one, we're trying to use English to speak about Hebraic thought. Two, we're going to modern Hebrew translations that have been translated abstractly from a classical thought versus the Hebrew concrete thought. Three, we're using the wrong Hebrew writing pattern. The writing pattern we see is the Assyrian Babylonian script. Whereas though if Moses existed, which I say that he did, he did exist. The problem is it's the wrong dynastic period that many Egyptologists are looking at. And what I'm saying is the Egyptian chronology is all 484 years. Moses was born, or he was born 1526 BCE. The Exodus was 1446 BCE. And I'm saying the dynastic period, even though technically the Comitians didn't have dynasties, that's Greek. That's, that's a Greek interpretation of Comitian thought. But it was 1446 BC at the end of the 12th dynasty. So to say all that, that means that Moses had a writing system. What was that writing system? What you call the pictorial synodic Hebrew, a form of hieroglyph was influenced by Medunetta. This is just facts. This is not, this is not because I'm a Hebrew Israelite, I'm not gonna lie and say that our script wasn't influenced by Medunetta. If we're in the land soldiering 430 years, naturally there's adaptation. The problem that I have with Kemetic School of Thought is they don't understand that there's an exchange of views socially. So just as the Megunetta influenced our script, we also influence Megunetta because we talk about a people to people environment. There wasn't an agenda of racism at this time because at this time, everybody would be considered um, phenol wise African. Okay, so we're, we're not going to, or African, Asiatic, however one wants to call it, these were all dark skinned, melanated people, simple and plain. We don't even want, even till it gets down to the Hicksos that they try to make seem like they were white, but these were people of color as well, from a variety, from the darkest of brown to the, the lightest color. You know, Hicksos only met rulers of foreign lands. So they considered Nubians Hicksos. They consider Phoenician Hyksos, anybody that was a foreigner to the, the Nasu, the people of Kemet, would be considered Hikso. But the, but to continue on what I'm saying, when you look at the Sinaitic pictorial Hebrew hieroglyph, it conveys a total different message. Prime example, if you look at sun in classical abstract Hebrew or Ben, they say Ben means sun, but that's abstract. You're saying sun, but it doesn't tell you how a sun functions or what a sun does. So if you look at the Hebrew hieroglyph or the Sinaitic Hebrew, you have a Bane or a bait and you have a noon. So the bait is an image of a house. That means to go within. It also means a family. Then you go to the new. It's an image of a seed sprouting up and moving forward. So when you put the bait and the new together, it becomes bane, which abstract Hebrew, they translate as sun. But in the Sinaitic pictorial Hebrew, it means the continuation of the family. One is defining a function, one is which is concrete, one is describing a uh, image, but without action. That's two different thoughts. So now when you look at Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, it doesn't give you the definite article how. It's in beginnings. So the Hebrews didn't tell their time linearly. They told it circularly with a line that would control the, the circular pattern. So in that retrospect, when you see these days, 
which actually means yom means the containment of life, not literal death. So each day is an epoch of time. So when you break down the bitter sheep coming from one dimension to another, by the way, of Merkaba life, you're talking about a 311 trillion, 40 billion year history, shrink going down from one dimension to another. So when you see day one, now we're in a state of from thought to more of a physical, etheric plane of existence. Each day we existed or containment of life correctly, but we existed within that form that we were adapted, but that we were adapting in by the way of the surrounding within each root epic or day. Yes. So Adam and Eve to you were not literal characters. Yes and no. Why do I say that? Ha Adam, it doesn't mean man. It doesn't mean man. The word man goes back to a Sanskrit word, manu, which means to think. When you look at the word Adam in the Hebrew, it says ha Adam. When you look at the word hey, it's an image of a man with outstretched arms within the Sinai pictorial Hebrew. Then you have the Aleph, which is an image of an ox head defining strength, first in rank. Then you have a Dalaf, which is an image of a doorway that you're going by way of a path. Then you have the Meme, which is an image of water waves. When you bring the Dalaf and the Meme together, it becomes as the blood of grapes. So now you talk about Dalma, blood, Remember that Allah, Adam. Now you're talking about the first blood or the first born. And you remember that Ha, the image of a man. So the word Ha Adam means the first born or the first blood rising with outstretched arms. So what happens when a child is born from the mother's matrix or the womb of a woman, right? Does not when a woman gives birth, don't you have first the water and then the blood? And then when the child comes out, isn't the child rising with outstretched arms towards the mother or towards the parents? So when you talk about Adam, you're talking about an ecological condition of avorious beings originally given birth by the way of the earth plane. And when them humans came, because we, were, we weren't fully coursed when we came. So we had both the, the masculine and feminine polarities. So when we would give birth originally, we would give as bud and as a plant. And that bud and would harden like in a cocoon-like substance and sprouted that way. As time developed, you see in the Genesis, it says that the red was taken from Ada Ha'adam. Well, the Hebrew word is Zalah, which is the side or the feminine principle within Ha'adam, not a literal red. So when you see this Zalah or this feminine principle separating, you're seeing the separation of polarities into sexes. So now in Genesis 2 7, in the Ivrit or the Hebrew, you see so called Wa Nikiva, male and female. So for those that deal with the Afrocentric Black conscious Kemet thought, women were on the planet first. To some Hebrew Israelites that believe men were on the planet first, no, both men and women came on the planet at the same exact time. Ha Adam wasn't a male nor a female but an ovarious being that had both masculine and feminine polarities, which later formed into the sexes. The deep sleep that the Ha'adam is going through is pure esoteric. It is talking about the separation of the polarities into sexes, and that took over 3.5 million years just to happen. Now, I noticed that you make a number of references to Hebrew words. Do you, I know the answer to this already, but for the, for the audience, do you read the King James Version of the Bible? No. Why I've read the King James Version 
because there's there's consistent mistranslations from both in the Old and the New Testament. There, there's just many mistranslations. See, at the mighty Hebrew University, we're not trying to make slaves. That's number one. People must understand the psychology of what they're reading, but they're not looking, they're not psychoanalyzing what they're reading. You are talking about a people that came from out of a world of sacrifice. I don't wanna use the word paganism because technically the word pagan is being used inappropriately because the word pagan doesn't even mean how people use it. So I don't wanna disrespect another people's culture by misusing that word. Like in the Wiccan culture, or wicked, the word pagan don't mean how it's being conveyed. So that's why I'm not using the word pagan because it's a disservice. It don't mean how people are conveying it to me. So I'm just gonna say a world of sacrifice. So if you have the Hebrews coming out of a world of sacrifice, then we must look at the psychology and behavior of an infant nation becoming a monarch and then their fall, you see? So when you look at certain scriptures, it has to be understood based on the social condition of that people at that time. What was going on at that Pacific time? Like for instance, Leviticus chapter 11, you'll see a dietary system. This is what you may eat, this is what you may not eat. But did anybody ever say, the animals that are being spoke about are the animals that are around them. So they had to adapt to that condition at that specific time. But true dietary consciousness is veganism. This is why when you see in the Genesis in Bereshit, chapter one, verse 29, you see the consumption of meat was vegetation. But later on, because of the ascended masters now going into a state of descent, excuse me, ascendance to descendants, right? Now you're seeing the craving of flesh. But because we were uh, observable people, we observed our environment. So we seen the animals that ate the vegetation, we consumed that. But now we are in a higher plane of existence. Logic only tells us if the animal is consuming the vegetation, should we not just consume the vegetation and not the animal? You see? So now we on another plane. So the scripture can only be understood based on the social condition of the people within each de de excuse me, dispensation. So wherever we act consciously in the Torah, that's how it broadens. The Torah, also, we don't supposed to be trying to follow the Torah like 3,500 years ago. What was applicable then may not be applicable for now. So we have to have, we have to, we gotta be practical. We, we, we can't be encrypted in a tomb. We are the Elohim, period. You, you will hear Hebrews saying it was our fault for disobeying the law. So let's bring it in practical sense. My mother said, if you make your bed lay in the heart, what goes around comes around. So if it was us that violated the universal law, wouldn't it only be logical for us to just return back and not wait on a mystery that we cannot prove? We have to understand the way that our people commune with the creator at that time. It was good for them at that time. But now we're in a whole nother dispensation where we understand we are that which wills to exist. What are the archaic antediluvian Hebrew symbols. Mm, that's that's a oh man, we have a few of them. 
We had a few of them, excuse me. We had a few of them. We had the swastika. Because remember, this might be, this might be, that was actually our one of our original symbols, the swastika. Why do I say that? Because when you study Abraham, he was from the tribe of Judah. Now one might say, what the hell are you talking about? I thought Jacob had a fourth son named Judah. Well, if you study the Parano records or any of the records like the Rav Veda, if you study the stands of Zion records from the Indos Valley, you'll understand historically there were two tribes of Judah. Your first tribe of Judah was from the Indos Valley, a Hebrew clan known as the Yadavas. The Yadavas is a Sanskrit way of saying Yahawada, Yahuda, Judah. Jacob named his fourth son Judah after the pre existing tribe that Abraham came from, from the Indos Valley. The original Hebrews are not from Mesopotamia, they're from the Indos Valley. When you go into Bereshit or Genesis chapter 11, it talks about how the people journeyed from the east and found the plain and called it Sinar. Sinar is the Hebrew word for Sumer. So we found Sumer. The word east is the Hebrew word Chadim. Chadim is another word that is used for the Indus Valley. The Yadavas is the tribe that Abraham came from. Abraham was a Hebrew, but his practices was Brahmanism. He was an ex-Brahmin that practiced an ancient form of Hinduism. These are just facts. These are just facts. Now, one might say, well, he was from all the Chaldeans. Well, first of all, it doesn't say in the Torah that he was born in Or. It doesn't say that. It says he resided in Or. But what they don't tell us is the Or of Mesopotamia is the 9th century BCE, historically. But if we're talking pre-antiquity, there was an Or that existed 8,000 BCE in the Indus Valley. There were two ores. The ore that you're reading in the Genesis is the ore of the Indus Valley, not Mesopotamia. When you're looking, this is why it starts you in the Indus Valley, and then you see them travel to Mesopotamia, and then you see them go to the land of Canaan and then Kemet. Even when you start talking Kemet, what a lot of the Kemetic scholars don't want to tell the people is Kemet is a colony of the Indus Valley. When you talk about pre-dynastic Kemet, when you talk about pre-dynastic Kemet and the Nasu, the pharaohs that sat on the, on the throne, they were trying to imitate the Nagas of pre-dynastic Kemet. The Nagas, Naga is a Sanskrit word that means serpent people. The serpent people came from an area of the Indus Valley known as Tamana Du. They are the ones that colonized Kemet during pre-dynastic Kemet, when Narmer or Minis the first unified upper in Kemet. Why? Because upper Kemet was dominated, well, this time when it was being dominated by the Nagas, they called it Grobanti. And the reason why they called this area Grobanti because it kept going underwater in different epochs of time. So now you have these Nagas that came from the Indus Valley representing the cobra. And watch this, brother. Go, go look it up. The cobra is an indigenous to Africa. It's indigenous to India. It's indigenous to India. So why is the Nasu in Kemet rocking the cobra? Unless there's some Indus Valley connections. And even people like Ashby and all them know, why you think they got books called Egyptian Yoga, Asarian Resurrection? Because even though they tried to say, well, the Indus Valley got these stuff from Kemet, but there's no proof to that. But we have the proof that it comes from the Indus Valley because the culture still exists. Like if you go to um, India, there's a high reverence for the cow. The cow is reverenced. And you will see in Kemet, one of the deities within the pantheon of Kemet is Hatar or Hatar, 
which, and you see the Israelites even making a golden calf. Now we're people on this planet adore the calf heavier than anybody on this planet, like the Hindus, like the Hindus. They got festivals in India, giving reverence, giving reverence to the baboon, to the monkey. Why do you have the monkey or the baboon within Kemetic Pantheon? Because the Kemetic Pantheon is really Brahmanistic or Hindu Pantheon. It really is. It's a colony of, of Hindustan or what we know as the Indus Valley. And this is in the Indus Valley records. Even when you start talking about the source of the Nile falling in Lake Victoria, European explorers that discovered the source of the Nile did not find it from the people of Sudan. They actually found it in Hindu records. These are just historical facts that the Hindus, and I don't mean your modern day Hindus, I'm talking about your original black Hindus with Wally, Wavier, the original, they documented this information and they Puranas. So what I'm saying is where Abraham came from, he came from out of a high scientific civilization known as the Indus Valley, migrated into Mesopotamia, settled for a while, then went into the land of Canaan, which today we know as Israel, which consisted of Palestine, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and the state of Israel. All of them together consisted as Israel or the land of Canaan. But our land stretched from the Nile to the Euphrates. So what I'm saying to the family is the only way to get a proper understanding, there has to be master teachers in your midst. In Deuteronomy or Debarium, or Debarium chapter 32, verse 7, it tells you to go to the leaders or the elders that they may tell you. It's just like you, you, you it's a difference from studying Buddhism, being self taught or going to just a regular Buddhist teacher on your street corner in London, in your London flat, or in your New York penthouse versus going into a Shaolin temple amongst abbots and monks, and you're, you're studying Buddhism. There's a science, there's a difference. There's a difference. So you have, that's the same thing with the Hebrew Israelite culture. There's a difference from this here in street corner Israelites, and such and such and such and such. And boom, boom, verse sitting amongst initiated adapts of Hebrew Israelite thought. There's a difference. There's a total difference. Talk to us about Hebrew cosmogenesis. Hebrew cosmogenesis is a system that I developed. It took me, I've been in the culture going on 32 years. I've been um, building Hebrew cosmogenesis now for 27 years. And I was influenced also um, the sister, um, excuse me, the brother to Hebrew cosmogenesis is Hebrew anthropogenesis. And I was influenced by the way of a woman by the name of Madam H.P. Babaski. And she wrote a book called The Secret Doctrine, volume one and volume two. The first one was called Cosmogenesis. The second was called Anthropogenesis. Her first book was called Isis and Bell. Um, the first book was called Science. The second one was called Theology. So when I was introduced to the secret doctrine from an elder, he said, you may not be fully ready, but I think you're ready. And I didn't understand what he meant by that until I started reading it. So as I'm reading it, one thing that I lacked was the understanding of archaic symbolisms, mythology, understanding the true intent of the mythos versus just saying, oh, it's a myth, it's not real, it's not real. That is not the intent of mythology. Um, people that speak like that have not a clue as to what they're talking about. And one of the movies that reveal many don't know what they talk about is the Da Vinci Code, 
When you watch The Da Vinci Code in the very beginning of the movie, you see Tom Hanks amongst a listening audience of college students or university students. And he was explaining um, the oral interpretation of symbolisms by the way of the mythos. Now I'm not saying everything that Tom Hanks said was correct, but the base of the ideas that he was conveying in the movie is 100% true. Like here's a prime example. If you go into what is known as the Bayani statues of Afghanistan, we look at these statues objectively from a religious standpoint and look at it as idol worship. But what we failed to understand that the statues really define the root epics that um, was being made manifested. This is why you see the first one being wrought, and, and I'm talking about the uh, Beninian statues that were destroyed by the Taliban, the Taliban in Afghanistan. You will see one real big, then it getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It was defining when we first were gigantic in nature. And as we went through the the Thorian or the Polarian root epic, then the Hyperborean root epic, then the Lumerian root epic, then in the Atlantean root epic. Now we're in what is considered now the Aryan root epic or the fifth root race or the fifth root cycle. And to make it clear, Madam H.P. Bavosky did not create the root races. These are, these are misconceptions that people have because she was one of the main light beamers of Eastern thought by the way of the West. You had Randolph Pascal, who was an actual at Rudolph Randall. He was the best friend of Abraham Lincoln. And guess what? He was a black man. And he was the founder of the Rosicrucian order in the United States. Madam H.P. Bavosky learned a lot from this black man, this so-called black man. Um, I'm, I'm speaking during the time he would have been considered a Negro during that time. So I'm being politically correct, so to say. Today, he would have been considered an African-American. He would be considered in today's time an African-American. You had, you had um, Annie Benson, you had uh, Randolph Steiner, you had different, uh, excuse me, Rudolph Steiner, you had um, um, lead, uh, lead Chaser, you had different people. Today you have them um, such as Philip Lindsay. You have these people that have a clear understanding of the root races, correctly I'll call them root epics. Um, the term race, doesn't define, let's make it clear. Um, the theop, those that were in the, the are in the, the um, theosophical society, when they say races, they're not talking about like race in the sense of a race. No, they're talking about an epic. So that has to be made clear. It's talking about an epic, not necessarily a distinguished nation because, or excuse me, a distinguished race, because when you look at the polarity, they were etheric in nature. Then when you look at the hyperborea, they were more of a watery element that was condensifying themselves. And then you get the Lumerian, which they acknowledge were the Aboriginal Blacks. And then as time go on, now you get into the Atlantean. They were Black, but now varieties are coming from Black to Copper. Then you get to the Aryan from Black now to the creamy and so white. So they're not talking about, so right now we're in the Aryan root epic. So you have, you're an Aryan because it only means noble one in Sanskrit. That's all it means. So your friend can be quote unquote, a, a, a Irishman. He's also an Aryan because it's not defining a race. That all came through the insanity of Adolf Hitler, 
and others within the dual society that distorted the Nordic history to make it seem like the Aryan race was a blue eyed blind hair group of beings that came from another planet and settled down on this earth. This is what they teach or they taught and to dominate the world through this energy called the flaw. You see what I'm saying? This is what they, this is within their understanding within the dark occult of the Nazi party. So uh, a lot of people will be like, oh, Madam H.B. Bavasky tore Adolf Hitler. No, she did not. These are, these are, these are uh, what you would call urban legends of knowledge, so to say. When Bavasky died, Adolf Hitler, he was a young, he was a child. He was a child. So he he was what four, three years old when she died. So not to say he wasn't influenced by certain teachings from her, <clears throat> but being influenced doesn't stop the fact that um you um misuse um her teaching. Excuse me for a second. I'm back. I had to take my medicine. So um, that's where I'm at with that. So <clears throat> she was a major influence, a major impact on my understanding of symbolism. And then once I got into the School of Prophets Institute, it helped me brought in my understanding to the point that I started studying different cosmologies of different nations talking about the Congo, if you're talking about the Akan from West Africa, if you're talking about Hinduism, Zen, um, Kabbalah, whatever the case, I found in all their beliefs, the core principle was all the same. It was all the same. So once I seen that, then I started to follow this pattern of written history into now it leaves the unwritten, but is it really unwritten or is the unwritten really written in the archaic symbols? So once I started to, <clears throat> excuse me, study the archaic symbols, then that's when the um, interdiluvian history started to come out and it's absolute. So my to Hebrew, thank you for joining us. We would definitely have to have a part two and I think even a part three. I know there's a lot more for you to discuss and teach, but thank you for your time today. Thank you. Hallelujah. Give a shout out to all Hebrews, white sovereign nationals all over the world. And thank you, Esoteric Thoughts, for having me on your show. Shalom Aleichem.